Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios for a CUBE conversation, get a little bit of a break from the conference madness, which is in full force right now. And we're excited to have our next guest. He's Mike Tukin, the CEO of Talent, uh, coming off a really good quarter. Mike, great to see you. Thank you, Jeff. You guys are on fire. You know, it's, it's a great time to be in the data business right now. <laughs> so give us a little update. What's, what's going on uh, recently? You've got a big show coming up. I imagine there's lots of announcements that are going to come out that you probably can't tell us about at the show. Uh, but go ahead and give a plug. It's coming up really soon and we'll just get into it. Yeah, exactly. So just in a couple weeks, um, Talent Connect in London on the 15th and 16th and Talent Connect in Paris on the 17th and 18th. And Talent Connect is our user conference. So we'll have hundreds of people there, a lot of partners there. We'll roll out a whole bunch of new product announcements and talk about a lot of the great stuff that our customers are doing with talent. So you've got an interesting way to kind of package up what you guys do in, in a really simple way. And that's, you said before we turn on the cameras, the first mile. You know, there's always so much conversation about the last miles, not necessarily in, in data, but in, in, you know, getting cable to your home and broadband and this, that, and the other. But you talked about the first mile. Arguably, that's a lot more important than the last mile. Well, you can't even get started on anything else until you solve the first mile problem, and that's what we do. And the problem is, right now, every single customer in the world is waking up to the power of data, and they need to be data-driven. They know it can make a huge difference in their business, and competitively, uh, the market leaders are all incredibly data-driven, and if companies aren't equally data-driven, then they get, fall behind. And so there's an incredible surge of interest in data-driven, uh, becoming data-driven right now, the challenge that everyone faces is in order to get started down that path, your data is locked up in a lot of different places. It's dirty, it's inconsistent, and until you bring it together, clean it up, and make it consistent, you can't do anything with it. That's right. the first mile. That's what we do. So how has it changed now? I mean, there's obviously been EDL and, and, and data cleansing issues for a very, very long time. So when you look at some of the, the trends, the, the growth of public cloud, obviously the explosion of data, now you guys are taking a little bit different approach than kind of the historical method. So how do you do it differently and why is that so important? From our perspective, we made a bet about five years ago when I joined that the, world, the entire landscape, the IT landscape was being reinvented from the ground up. Not just the data world, data world for sure, but the entire IT landscape was being reinvented. And that meant you had to solve the problem differently. And so from our perspective, there's four or five big trends that are completely reshaping the IT landscape. Number one, of course, is the move to the cloud. You, you talked about it just a second ago, but we're probably 10 years into a 20 or 30 year shift to the cloud, and it's actually accelerating right now. We're now seeing not just early adopters, but mainstream companies are now making a big bet on the cloud and deciding that's where they're going to be you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, we're seeing the, the move to more and more self-service, where rather than having an IT team solve all your data problems, they're seeing um, you know, data analysts and um, data scientists are solving the problems themselves. And so creating a world where all of those different roles can uh, play together in a, in a team sport kind of way is right, an important right. way. Um, it's moving to more and more real time, right? Everything back 10, 20 years ago used to be done in batch. So, you know, at the end of the day or end of the week or end of the month, you collect a whole bunch of stuff and package it together and crank it through. But, you know, think about today's applications, right? The expectation is it's done in real time. If you, if you uh, make a deposit in a bank, you expect to look up the, the bank balance and see it right there. You don't expect to see it there the next day. Right, right. right? Um, you, you expect your apps to be immediately responsive. That's real time, right? It's now this ubiquitous expectation. And that's, that means that data integration needs to follow that. Tightly connected with that is the move to uh, machine learning, right? Companies now don't want to do all of the analytics and um, insight generation with a whole bunch of people looking at data. Because machines can do that a whole lot better, right? right. Machines are right. really, really good at finding patterns. And so those are some of the big trends that we see that are completely reshaping the landscape. So clearly data integration today is just very different than where it was right. five or 10 years ago. It's so funny, you know, we, we, we go to a lot of shows and there's always a lot of com uh, conversation about innovation. How do you innovate? And, and to me, one of the, the really simple answers, not necessarily simple to implement, is you give you know, more people in the organization you know, more access to more data and the tools to manipulate it and then ultimately hopefully to make decisions you know, based on that output. So it is you know, kind of unlocking it. It is un, you know, giving more people that access. You talked about self-service uh, and cloud and really pushing that out. And then the, the other funny thing, when you talk about real time, um, 
is, you know, used to make decisions based on a sample of things that happened in the past. Now, with the capacity of the machines, the, the complete, basically infinite capacity from an individual company point of view of a cloud application, now, hopefully, I'm making decisions on all the data while it's happening. Completely different way. Yes, yes, and as a matter of fact, the, the outliers sometimes are really an important part of the data. And so, looking at, you know, not just where, are, where does most of the data fall, but why are the outliers there? What do they mean? Right? In a fraud detection case, the outliers are the frauds, usually, right? right? So it's an important part of the data, and looking at the entire data set allows you to find that. Right. If you're looking at a sample, you miss it. So as we look forward to, to machine learning, the la kind of the last part of your, of, of your four key drivers, that's a, that's a big impact on the way these things work. So my, my favorite little example on, on machine learning and AI is, is the new Google uh, Gmail on that little tiny response that it suggests that on your reply, which seems relatively straightforward, right? Thanks, you know, uh, I'll get right back to you. You know, they're relatively short usually. But the amount of machine learning and artificial intelligence and data analysis that goes into the generation of those my three responses versus your three response options back to me is pretty phenomenal. And you guys are now going to be able to bake that into all types of different type processes. That's right. And that's right, and, and you, know, you described a, a really cool consumer scenario around email, but there's a bunch of commercial scenarios around you know, things like predictive maintenance. You know, GE with his big gas turbines. If that thing goes um, offline at the wrong time, it can be really expensive. Right. Because you know, then you have customers that are out of service, and it turns out it takes hours to spin up a new um, gas turbine that might be sitting idle. Um, but if you can do it in a maintenance window, it's just not a big deal at all. Right. And so if they can predict when parts are about to fail, that's a savings of literally billions of dollars across their install base. Um, we have um, one of the major car companies is, um, did a really cool analysis around um, predicting potential um, recalls based on in manufacturing as um, tools were starting to go out of alignment. And what they could do is start to track and say, if it gets more than this far out of alignment, the odds of a recall go up dramatically. And so now's the time to intervene and readjust that tool because you know, a recall is a very, very expensive thing. If you can fix it up front in the tool, you're saving millions of dollars. Right. Fascinating examples of real world industrial scenarios using machine learning. Right, and, and disconnected kind of data sets that actually are tied together in hindsight, but you know, probably the person who's responsible for keeping that, that machine up and running isn't really thinking about the impact of the company if there's a recall on that particular model of car. Yeah, exactly, who would have known that the tolerance, that you know, the acceptable tolerance was exactly this, right? How would, how would you set that in advance? But it turns out when you actually start running the, you know, the correlations and, and you know, throw some um, learning algorithms at it, you can really start pinpointing it and say, for this tool, it's this. For right. this other tool, it might be something else. So the other kind of big trend that you didn't mention in this explosion of data is using so many more data sets. You know, going beyond the data that you own, that you generate, that you create, and pulling in a lot of this external data, whether it's weather data, whether it's uh, social sentiment data. You know, there's so many data um, repositories now that you can integrate in with that proprietary data to then drive, you know, kind of a, a, a secret a secret sauce algorithm that gives you that competitive advantage. You see more and more of that. And I think you you mentioned kind of the sloppy, crazy variability in all these data sets as you're trying to pull them into these systems. That's right, that's right. And we're seeing a, a bunch of customers doing that. You know, it's an interesting scenario of a, um, we have a, a customer that does uh, soil testing. Um, for farmers with a neat little device, it's kind of an IoT scenario, they plug it in, does a soil test, sends it up to the cloud, now correlates that soil with the, um, the weather patterns in that area um, to say here is the uh, seeding and fertilizing um, regimen that we should be using for this plot of land. Right. Right, really cool scenario. Well, I'll tell you even a crazy version. I, I, I talked to a guy that ran a, a drone company with the sensors that did a similar type of thing. They run the drone and they, they analyze the field. And I, I had to ask him, I'm like, come on. I mean, people have been sampling fields for, forever. This can't be new, right? And it feeds back to their little Monsanto engine or whatever that tells you what to do. He goes, yeah, but here's what's different, Jeff. Again, we used to take a sample. We would take sample points on that field and we would make, make a decision based on that sample. He goes, now I can track literally every single plant. That's cool. 
every single plant with, with, with the consistency of this drone coverage, and now I can micro, micro, micro the application of water, the application of, hy of you know, hydrogen, whatever they give, herbicides, et cetera. Yeah, Pretty and amazing. what we're seeing now is that the tractor companies are doing that on a, as you say, on a, on a per seed um, basis as they're driving through the field based on samples that have been taken, based on drone surveys of what's there and based on the weather pattern. I mean, right. it's really cool what we're doing in terms of precision farming right, right. now. Right, so, so I'll just take that kind of one step further. The, the other trend that's coming down the pike uh, which is big and not going to have less data, but a lot more is is IoT. So you know, from where you're sitting, you've been in this business a while. As you look at kind of this next generation of explosion of all this additional machine generated data, you know, what type of you know kind of future do you see? How is that going to play? And what kind of opportunities is that going to open up? There's a whole another you know multiple orders of magnitude of data coming soon. Yeah. No. So IoT is clearly a it multiplies the amount of data by literally an order of magnitude of, and it, it, many of the streams are real time in nature, um, and the you know, absolute requirement then is that you're doing some sort of machine learning to take advantage of it. Uh, to me, you can, you can take almost any industry and talk about a potential machine learning scenario in the industry. My favorite one right now is you know, cars, right? This one's, you know, it's now, it's, it's in real life, it's not a future thing. If you're driving a Tesla right now, your car is actually starting to um, you know, fix itself sometimes, literally. I got a call one time, I was driving down the road. We said, hey, we've detected this fault in your, in your car, and um, if it's okay with you, we're going to reset it right now, and um, it'll be fine. And I was like, what was the problem? Don't worry about it. Well, that's pretty cool, right? When was the last time? <laughs> Did they at least ask you to pull over first? <laughs> yeah. But no, the whole idea of having a car that's self-diagnosing and, and fixing itself is really cool, right? That's, well, that's a game changer, I on, think. On so many ways. I mean, not only that, but you generalize that to a much broader audience. I mean, it used to be you, you made your product, you, you sent it to your distributor, and you maybe had some assumptions of how it's used, how it's not used, how are people using the features that you create, are they not using, or are they using the way you thought? And now with this connected feedback loop, you know, the ability for manufacturers to know how people are using their tools, even beyond just the prescriptive maintenance, is a phenomenal yes. impact. Yes, and you know, in, in that particular scenario, for those kind of smart devices, not just the one-way feedback loop, but closing the loop and, and the in-field updatability right. is, you know, you, co you combine those two and wow, that's, cr that's, it's a whole new world. Right, I guess software really is eating the world. I guess, yeah, uh, yeah, I, guess exactly. you, I guess you had it right way back when. All right, Mike, well thanks for uh, stopping by. Good luck on your event um, across the pond here in a couple of weeks and great to catch up. All right, thank you, Jeff. All right, he's Mike, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. It's a CUBE conversation in our Palo Alto studios. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.